The Holy Gospel is written in the 15th chapter of St. Luke and it is on page 1039, beginning with the first verse. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear Jesus. <coughs> and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he find it. And when he found it, he laid it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he had come home, he called together his friends and his neighbors saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. So just, just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Grace be unto you from God our Father and for our, from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. If you paid attention to the lessons uh, that we read and the hymns that we've used, they all center on the Good Shepherd and in some way talk about the lost. And so today we want to talk about Jesus who saves the lost. It may be a strange question, but who are the lost? Ron said there's six billion people who may be among the lost. Who, who are the lost? Well, I'm going to say something that may shock you. You are the lost. You are lost until the Lord Jesus Christ finds you and comes into your life and pays the price for all your sin and redeems you and sends His Holy Spirit upon you to change your life. I'm not worried about this group of lost. But do you know someone who's lost? Our parable today is about one who is lost. Now, I, I, I'm concerned about the, the, the six billion that Ron talked about who are the lost. And there's some things I can do about reaching some of those. But the most important is the one person I know who is lost. What do I do to see that one person know about the kingdom of God? And I'm sure you know one person. It may be a family member. It may be a neighbor. It may be somebody else that you know. But you know 
that person has wandered away from the truth. Maybe at one point they were a part of a church or a fellowship of believers. But this world's culture entices so many people to walk away from what they once knew and believed. Just nibbling away and away and away until they no longer care about their own salvation. Most of the time, <clears throat> these people that we know who are lost are people who would probably not admit they were lost. Oh, they learn some Bible verses in Sunday school or as children, youth class groups. But the world is so enticing out there. And there's so much other things and pleasures to enjoy that we can lay this faith of ours aside. And sooner or later, it's no longer a, a care or a concern for those people for ourselves, for the lost. How do we reach those? How do you reach the person in your family who's lost? Well, it doesn't do any good to grab them by the throat and shake them and say, you know, you've got to learn to get saved. You, they don't think they're lost. They grew up with the Bible stories. They know about Christmas and Jesus' birth. They know about Easter. And they believe that Jesus did all of that. And that's enough. That's the little whisper in, in the ear of the person as Satan says, you have enough. You know enough for salvation. We who know are a part of the flock, know that that's not enough for that person's salvation. So how do we reach them? Well, one of the first things you do is to continue to love them. Love them. Love them. Don't criticize them. Don't condemn them. Don't judge them. Love them. and pray for them. As Ron said this morning, the mother who prayed for her wandering son who was in the military. It may take years. I don't know how old that young man was, but I'm going to say 21. <coughs> I mean, somewhere in that age group kind of thing. Until God answered the prayer. It may take a long time to reach out to that family member who doesn't want to know and doesn't want you to talk about it. But you do have a responsibility to keep seeking, seeking a way to encourage them to know this Christ who has taken away that sin, that rejection, that fear, and brought to us that joy. And so there are some things we, we can do for that person as we seek to, to uh, reach out to them. I like to say, don't point out their sin. They'll point out yours. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we can admit we have sin, but we know that we will confess our sin and claim that gift of forgiveness that God has given to us. Now they may say they will do the same, but for that to be real, for that confession of sin, re repentance means to change. And many of those who have wandered away will confess their, their sin, but they don't want to change. They want to stay in the lifestyle and the enjoyments of this world's pleasures.
One of the things you can do is without judgment, you can tell a person if you've been staying in relationship with them. It's a Thanksgiving dinner or a Christmas party or sometime you're with this, I'm going to say relative, because I think they, these are the sums that we care about the most. And then how do we do that? Well, we, as I say, you show love, you pray for them, but you also tell them your story. Tell them what God is doing in your life now. Not what he did back when you were a child. That's important too. But if God is really active in your life, you have a story to tell them from yesterday. Or sometime soon. Even if it is just, I really enjoyed worship this week. It was about the good shepherd seeking the lost. And they may say something, ignore your question or your statement, pay, not, pay no attention to what that was, but at least you've been a witness, part of your faith. And if you have that opportunity on Thanksgiving, maybe you have it again at Christmas, or at some birthday, or someplace along the line. And they can't help but hear and know your joy. Live in that joy. Live in that. Now, I'm not an exciting person. I, I don't run around with a big smile on my face and being happy and slap bad. I've got a, a really good friend, neighbor, that I just love her because that's what she is all the time. <laughs> and she's a really good witness. And I, I'm jealous of that. Can I say that? Can that? That's a sin. Um, I've been jealous of people all my life. But I've repented of it many times and I don't think I'm as jealous as... <coughs> I want the Holy Spirit to bring me that joy, that, that excitement. And if you've made the statement and they don't say anything, but they might, they may make a comment about it. Try to turn that around, not to be preachy, but to ask a question. Something like maybe, what do you think of that? I mean, I'm talking about today's message in the sense that Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd, is seeking the lost. And it was a marvelous uh, service as we sang all the hymns that was about that and all the scriptures were about that. And, 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 and even the Gideon's message was about that and the preacher brought about the same thing too. So they may make a comment. You may just simply say, it's always best to ask a question than to, than to try to get in to be the preacher. Now I want to be the preacher sometimes. I'm, I'm on the wrong side of this issue, but you don't have to be. You can ask the question, what does that mean to you? <coughs> maybe, they'll, maybe they won't answer it. Maybe they'll, they'll go their own way. But at least you've raised a question in their lives. And you may have an opportunity down the road sometime to answer for them. <coughs> and then listen. Listen like you've got a whole head full of ears. And I try not, not, not be the answer. Just listen. When my wife comes to me with something that she's concerned about, she just wants me to listen. And I want to fix it. <laughs> it's hard for me not to try to be a fixer. And it might be that for you. But ask for the Holy Spirit to work in your life so that you don't have to be the preacher. You can be the questioner. And if you're right, sometimes ask the right question. That may cause the spirit in them to want an answer. Now, it doesn't tell us how long Jesus, or the good shepherd, or the shepherd in the story, went searching for the sheep. 
but it does say until he found it. And when he found it, he rejoiced. I brought along today the page of our August newsletter. I think almost everybody in the congregation answered something about their list, their joy. I didn't. Uh, they didn't ask me. But I w I'll, I'll tell you. My joy is when I eat some apple pie a la mode. <laughs> which I do not need. But which I love. Almost as much as I love the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I have to limit myself to the apple pie, but I don't have to limit myself to the Lord Jesus Christ. There is joy if you have ever brought a person who may have been a part of a church at one time and now has nibbled their way away, wandered away, and you are a part of bringing them back. There is more joy. As the Passage says, there's more joy in heaven over that lost one who comes through the door to be redeemed than all the rest of us sitting here who know we are redeemed. Can we seek to so bring joy to heaven that we go like this shepherd to find that one lost person. May God give us that grace. <clears throat> Let us sing our next hymn.